Welcome to this video in which we introduce a class of uh, discrete time signals called complex exponentials. And complex exponentials are actually kind of strange beasts in the sense that um, they end up looking a lot like sinusoids. So we'll explain why and how as we go through the video. So a complex exponential in general is a signal that has uh, this basic structure where in the most general case this C is a constant that's complex and alpha is also complex and uh, we'll write alpha as e to the r plus j omega where both r and omega are real numbers. Okay. And it turns out, uh, the reason we call this a complex exponential is that we uh, have part of, um, uh, part of the exponent of e here is j, uh, which uh, is the square root of negative 1 and makes things complex. So um, this can get to be pretty interesting. So if we write out what x of n is, again, c, and we take alpha as we've defined it here and raise this to the nth power, we have e to the r plus j omega, and this is all raised to the nth power, and we can rewrite this as c e r times n times e j omega n. So what I'm doing here is I'm using the fact that when I raise something to the nth power, it's the same as uh, multiplying uh, the exponents. And I'm also saying that if I have a sum of two exponents, I can break it up into two sums. Okay. And uh, just because we need something to call it, I'm going to call this beta. I'm sorry. I'm going to call the e to the r part beta. And so what I have here is beta to the n. So I can write this then as c beta to the n e to the j omega n. And why do I want to do that? Well, um, let's start with this e to the j omega n thing. Um, those of you that have not yet heard of Euler's formula uh, will hear more about it than you really want in a signals and systems class. Uh, the idea is that e to an imaginary, raised to an imaginary number can be written as the cosine of omega n plus j times the sine of omega n. Okay. And again, for those of you that haven't been paying careful attention, j is the square root of negative 1. I should have pointed that out up here. Uh, unlike mathematicians who use i, engineers, and at least electrical types of engineers use j because i is always current. Now, um, a consequence of Euler's formula, which we won't really go into right now, but turns out to be extremely useful in many cases, um, I can also write the cosine of omega n in terms of complex exponentials. So I can it ends up being 1 half times e to the j omega n plus e to the minus j omega n. And similarly, the sine of omega n is 1 over 2j e to the j omega n minus e to the minus j omega n. So anyway, Euler's formula, so I guess I should say these are Euler's formulas because uh, uh, they are, there are several of them, but they show up over and over again and they're extremely useful. So what this means then, this fact that e to the j omega n can be broken into a real part, which is a cosine, and an imaginary part, which is a sine, if I plug this back in here, what it means is that um, my samples x of n are going to basically be uh, this exponentially weighted guy, this beta to the n, times a 
cosine real part and a sine imaginary part. So this complex exponential actually has sinusoidal components. Again, the cosine real part and the sine imaginary part. So if you graph this, um, which I have done, uh, this is the sort of thing that you get. Okay, so if beta is 1, so that I have basically, uh, there's a 1 to the n here, but that doesn't actually affect anything. So this is a case where beta would be equal to 1. And what I've done here is graphed the real and imaginary parts of this complex exponential. And you can see that it has a frequency of pi over 4. And the real part uh, starts as a cosine. So it starts at 1, goes down, and hits bottom here, goes back up, and so on. So it does indeed look like a cosine. The imaginary part is a sine that starts here, goes up and down, and up and down, and so on. So um, this complex exponential, if I have no uh, constant out in front raised to the n, is just basically a cosine uh, combined with a sine. If I have the case where beta here is 0.9, then the real part looks like this. It starts up here at 1. I guess I shouldn't be coloring in. It starts at 1, um, goes down, and you can see that the real part, the amplitude of the real part is getting smaller. And the imaginary part, the same thing happens. The amplitude starts out big and then gets smaller. And that's because beta being less than 1, as we raise beta to higher and higher powers, it gets smaller and smaller. On the other hand, if I have beta equal to 1.1, then I start off with a uh, real part that's small and gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Now again, it still looks like a cosine, but as time goes on, the magnitude of the cosine gets larger and larger. And the same thing for the sine, which is the imaginary part. So again, I have an exponentially weighted uh, cosine as the real part and an exponentially weighted sine as the imaginary part. Okay, now given that, well, and I guess I should make this clear. I'm not sure if I've made this completely clear, but this x of n is complex. It has a real part and an imaginary part. And as a complex number, each xn can then could be represented in terms of its magnitude and a phase angle. Um, so, for example, uh, sometimes you'll see it done this way, x of n is a magnitude, which is a real number, and some angle, which is some sort of function of n. Uh, other notations that you might see is m n at an angle of theta n. But the idea is because it's complex, I can talk about its magnitude and its phase. So if I graph the magnitudes, I get this. This is basically the magnitude of xn. And you can see in this first case, where I just have sines and cosines, uh, the magnitude is always 1. Okay, so the magnitude of this complex number is always 1, or this complex uh, sequence. Um, when beta is 0.9, you can see that the magnitude decreases exponentially. And when beta is 1.1, you can see that the magnitude increases exponentially. So um, I guess the point of this is just to show that the magnitude of the complex exponential depends on this term. And then uh, its angle, which I've also graphed in the next picture, uh, depends on this term. Okay, so what I've actually got here is the angle. It's sometimes called the argument or the angle. It's basically um, uh, the angle associated with this complex number. It starts at 0, goes up to um, pi over 4, pi over 2, 3 pi over 4, and pi, and so on. And what I've done here is graphed, again, the real part. Oops the real part and the imaginary part of xn. And you can see that an angle of 0 corresponds to something that's completely real. 
an angle of pi corresponds to something that's completely real and negative. An angle of pi over 2 corresponds to a real part that's 0 and an imaginary part that's 1. At an angle of, um, assuming this would be, let's see, oh here, this would be minus pi over 2 or 3 pi over 2. Uh, either one of those is the same. Again, I have a real part that's 0 and an imaginary part that's negative. So again, this, the angle is a function of uh, the relationship between the real and imaginary parts. So that pretty much wraps up this video. And at this point, you may be saying, well, why should I care? Uh, the reason that you should care is that these complex exponentials, these videos, or I'm sorry, videos, these signals that look like this actually show up all over the place in signal processing. When we do Z transforms, uh, they show up there. When you do discrete time Fourier transforms, they show up there. They basically just show up all over the place. So it's useful to understand them and understand how they work. So I hope this video has been helpful. Thanks for watching.